want to thank Trump and his nitwit slaves for giving President Biden the chance to run for re-election on a platform of bipartisan border security and a good economy? Oh, and I also want to thank Trump for giving Nikki Haley enough oxygen to last through at least South Carolina. But I especially want to thank the late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia for writing a decade ago that the president is too a, quote, officer of the United States and thus unknowingly blowing up Trump's only argument that he can't be disqualified from office under the 14th Amendment because he engaged in insurrection. Remember, the entire Trump defense is that the 14th Amendment does not apply to him because the phrasing of the disqualification clause says any officer of the United States who engages in insurrection is ineligible, but that the president, his argument goes, is not an officer of the United States. This is from Roger Parloff, formerly the main legal writer at Forbes, now a senior editor at Lawfare. In 2014, he writes, the Supreme Court decided a case, Canning, involving the recess appointments of three commissioners to the National Labor Relations Board. The conservatives upheld a challenge to these appointments, and Scalia wrote a concurrence which included this tantalizing sentence. Except where the Constitution or a valid federal law provides otherwise, all, quote, officers of the United States must be appointed by the president by and with the advice and consent of the Senate. Well, two conservative lawyers, Messrs. Blackman and Tillman, veteran water carriers for the argument that the president is not an officer, wrote to Justice Scalia in horror, the legal equivalent of, wait, what? And that was just the start of it. Scalia wrote them back, quote, Dear Mr. Tillman, I meant exactly what I wrote. The manner by which the president and vice president hold their offices is provided otherwise by the Constitution, as is the manner by which the Speaker of the House and President Pro Tempore of the Senate hold theirs. Sincerely, Antonin Scalia. Well, I'm no legal scholar. I'm just a simple country lawyer, so I don't know about the sincerely part. But if somebody writes you to explain what you meant by all officers of the United States are appointed by the president except where the Constitution or the law says otherwise, and you reply that you meant the president, vice president, speaker of the House, and president pro tempore of the Senate, you are saying that the president and those others are officers of the United States. Is it too much to hope that the lawyers who are arguing for disqualification of the president as officer under the 14th are aware of what Antonin Scalia wrote? Do you know any of them? Could you send them a candy gram or an FTD bouquet to that effect? Wait, there's more. Mr. Parloff of Lawfare suggests opinion by association. Three justices joined Alito's concurrence in the Canning case, so they may have already gone on record as saying they also believe the president is an officer of the United States. They would be a Mr. C. Thomas, a Mr. S. Alito, and a Mr. Chief Justice Roberts. And the Trumpists could get away with sliming Alito, And they could get away with betraying Thomas. And they could get away with bulldozing Roberts. They've already tried that. But he who argues against the sainted Antonin Scalia may soon find himself metaphorically sleeping with the metaphorical fishes. Because on July 3rd, 2020, in a fake patriotic speech so overflowing with enough half-witted, flag-waving syrup that it could cover every pancake in the United States of America tomorrow morning, somebody out there proposed a National Garden of American Heroes to honor the greatest Americans to ever live. And it was really as stupid a list of 30 names as you could cobble together. It included Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, Douglas MacArthur, the Wright Brothers, Christopher Columbus, Billy Graham, and of course... Antonin Scalia and the National Garden of American Heroes honoring, quote, the greatest Americans to ever live 
including Antonin Scalia, was proposed by Trump, who Scalia may have personally just gotten thrown off the ballot. <laughs> Because you can stupid some of the people all of the time, and you can stupid all of the people some of the time, but you cannot stupid all of the people all of the time. If this Scalia from the dead story ain't evidence enough of that, quote, It's interesting, says James Lankford, the pastiest Republican in their Senate caucus and the lead negotiator on a bipartisan border deal. He said this on Fox. When we're finally getting to the end, Republicans are like, oh, just kidding. I actually don't want a change in law because of presidential election year. Well, there's Biden's instant campaign ad number 223. The last thing he needs to do, said Nikki Haley, is tell them to wait to pass a border deal until the election. We can't wait one more day. And there's Biden's instant campaign ad number 224. Apart from the material impacts of this on Ukraine funding, on the reality that whatever you think, whether it's a crisis or just a logistical nightmare, whatever is happening on the border is escalating and is being escalated in a second way by Republican stunt governors who are sending refugees to blue states. And it is now being escalated in a third way by many of these same stunt governors who sent wooden soldiers to the border to enact their fascist gubernatorial will when at any moment Biden can federalize those same soldiers and order them to do the opposite of what the governor sent them to do. Apart from that practical stuff on the ground, there is also the more visceral reality that as long as loser Jay Trump and thus his slaves in the Republican Party continue to prevent a border deal, anything that happens on the border from accidents to terrorism to a single fentanyl death anywhere in America between now and November or possibly between now and next January is not only Trump's fault, but it will be blamed on Trump by Republicans like Nikki Haley and James Lankford. Nice work, Trump. A lot of the senators are trying to say respectfully they're blaming it on me. I said, that's OK. Please blame it on me, please. You got it, moron. The linchpin of Trump's meager policy platform, and he just single handedly, proudly destroyed it. The one part of Trump 2024, I hate everybody you hate, that is attached even by a pinky toe to a quarter inch of reality, and he just managed to spill it all over himself and all over his party and those Nazis in Texas, Greg Abbott and Dan Patrick, real name Danny Gobe, and Pat Fallon and Andy Biggs and Mark Green and Marjorie Taylor, Barney Rubble Green and Mike Johnson, who all went head first through the metaphorical windshield of the impeachment of Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas, because suddenly Mayorkas is the immigration hardliner, and they are the ones demanding open, unchecked, and unimpeded border crossings. So if there are terrorists there, remember, Marge Green sent them. Marge and El Trumpo. Oh, and not content with that, they also screwed up their charges against Mayorkas. Item three accuses him of having, quote, terminated asylum cooperative agreements that would have equitably shared the burden of complying with international asylum accords, unquote. Oops, not guilty. Those were terminated by, not by Mayorkas, but by the Secretary of State. That's a different guy, Republicans. Other than that, and impeaching him for refusing to testify on the exact day he was instead meeting with his counterparts in Mexico to press them about international asylum accords, and of course refusing to testify to them in general while refusing to let him testify during the impeachment process. That's all they got. Good work, everyone. And then there is Nikki Haley, who has now somewhere loudly, without verbal fire escapes behind her for a week every day of that week said that trump is is nuts is unhinged and who when trump threatened to bar permanently her donors started selling permanently barred merch and it's not just that she's doing all this this dry narrow-minded unimaginative sour person 
appears to be having a ball doing this. Election night, Trump gets on stage. He throws an absolute temper tantrum talking about revenge. And Donald Trump was totally unhinged. Unhinged. I do think that he is in decline, and I think that he needs to know to step away. I do think that he surrounds himself in chaos, and we can't be a country in disarray and have a world on fire and be in chaos. I do think that these court cases are distracting, not just to the American people, but to him himself, which is keeping him from talking about what really matters. That's exactly why I don't think he should be president. Now, I'm not deluding myself here. Nikki Haley has already pre-endorsed Trump for whenever he does knock her off. So what is this about? Trump's recent extra, extra large insanity has been propelled by his awareness that he could have his own Annus Auribulus in just the next 30 days. Trump already got the E. Jean Carroll verdict, $83 million, and if we didn't make it clear the first time, you're a rapist. Judge Arthur Engeron is due to rule on the New York business fraud case imminently, maybe this week. That's another $370 million. It's not like he has to pay by 5 p.m. or that he can't appeal, but technically that would pretty much wipe out his own claimed cash on hand. Trump's presidential immunity scam is likely to come crashing to earth before March 1st. And of course, the patron saint of judicial fascism, Scalia, believed that a president was an officer of the United States, which would mean he's eligible to be disqualified under the 14th Amendment. Oh, and the only recent polling in South Carolina, which was last week, has Trump steady at 58 and Haley up to 31. And the average of polls there already had Trump's lead to down to 33 points. And for our purposes, this is not about Haley somehow getting the nomination. It is about two things. One, the fact that as half of the Republicans in Iowa opposed Trump, we may see a third or more of them in South Carolina oppose Trump. And two, that she thinks there is enough of a chance that the next month in the New York courts, in the Supreme Court, in the Court of Public Opinion, will kill him, metaphorically or otherwise. Or zooming out a little, that she believes that it isn't just about Trump getting fricasseed by a couple of New York lawsuits, it's about him then appealing these verdicts and thus prolonging the public's awareness of them and the continued viability of the 14th Amendment process, and whether Trump can be defeated not by losing, but by his cult fearing that he will lose. Above all else, they back him because they perceive him as a winner. The moment they stop perceiving him as a winner, they will kill him and eat him. Anything new that breaks against Trump before South Carolina, and Haley may find yet another Rubicon to cross. She's already said the more obvious things Republicans have been mortally terrified of saying about him. He doesn't have policies. He doesn't talk about people anymore besides himself. He's crazy, and he's getting crazier by the minute. She came close to that next river when she said she trusted the jury in the E. Jean Carroll case. The last leap is to say Trump is a crook who is conning them all and has just been lucky so far avoiding jail and that they may be nominating a guy who will be a convicted felon before the election itself. Right now, Haley's idea seems to be you don't have to lock him up. You just have to wear him down. Where do we get that impression? Well, here's your roundup of the recent additions to the Dementia J. Trump Hall of Fame on day 15 of this the mental health crisis of dementia J. Trump. The first non-incumbent, and remember this, look at this. We got Mexico to send 2,000, 28,000 troops to caucus on February 8th. And if you need any detail, and we will restore on this planet peace through Earth. I am the only candidate who can make this promise to you. You know, I had an uncle. He's the longest serving professor Dr. John Trump, in the history of MIT, same genes, we have genes, we're smart people. We're smart people, you know? We're like race, Mr. Lieutenant Governor, we're like racehorses too. You know, the fast ones produce the fast ones and the slow ones doesn't work out so well, right? They say the president that was treated the worst was Abraham Lincoln, but he had the Civil War, you know, so he had a little Civil War going. Abraham Lincoln, I haven't seen the new list, but if I'm not number one over Abraham Lincoln, I will be very disappointed. Treated worse than Lincoln? Be careful what you wish for, bub.
to be fair, being disqualified by Scalia from beyond the grave and having this fantasy of presidential immunity evaporated by Alexander Hamilton in a kind of mild rap, no doubt, that might be worse than what happened to Lincoln. Federalist number 69, Friday, March 14th, 1788. This has been making the rounds lately. Where were you and what were you doing when you first read that Alexander Hamilton had written this? Quote, the president of the United States would be liable to be impeached, tried, and upon conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes or misdemeanors, removed from office, and would afterwards be liable to prosecution and punishment in the ordinary course of law. There are two other developments in the 14th Amendment issue that are actually more recent than March 14, 1788. One, showing the clarity of history. The other, the desperation of today to muddy history up because everybody is scared. A retired Illinois judge, a Republican, heard the bid to ban him from the ballot there, ruled there is no question Trump did engage in insurrection, but also recommended to the state election board that courts should decide whether or not he should be on the ballot. The Illinois State Board was to hold a hearing on that today. Again, there's no need. 25 historians led by the preeminent living Civil War scholar, Princeton's James McPherson, have submitted an amicus brief to the Supreme Court supporting the Colorado bid to keep Trump off the ballot there. The key argument, which I have made here and I have not seen a lot elsewhere, and no, I'm not a lawyer, is that the 14th is self-executing. Trump doesn't need to be disqualified because actually he already is disqualified. To quote them, no former Confederate instantly disqualified from holding office under Section 3 was disqualified by an act of Congress. They noted that when Jefferson Davis was indicted for treason, he said it was an invalid indictment because he had already been disqualified from holding office in the restored union. McPherson and the other historians also noted that President Andrew Johnson referred to himself as the nation's chief executive officer and found the transcript of a congressional debate from the time of the passage of the 14th Amendment that gets to the false confusion over officer or not an officer. Quoting their paper, Senator Reverdy Johnson of Maryland, a Democratic opponent of the 14th Amendment, challenged sponsors as to why Section 3 omitted the president. Republican Lot Morrill of Maine replied, Let me call the senator's attention to the words or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States. Johnson admitted his error. No other senator questioned whether Section 3 covered the president. Plus, Antonin Scalia says so. Also of interest here, this is already a week in which the non-immigration nut jobs also outstupided each other. Did you know that there was a conspiracy to send Taylor Swift to seduce Travis Kelsey and thus become the Yoko Ono who destroyed the Kansas City Chiefs of the National Football League? But there is also a conspiracy to fix all the National Football League games to make sure that Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift get to the Super Bowl so that at halftime... They can endorse Joe Biden. Yeah, I know these these two things both can't be true, and, and neither of them actually is true. But just remember, consistency is irrelevant if you are as stupid as Vivek Ramaswamy or Clay Travis. That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. <laughs> This is Sports Center. Wait, check that. Not anymore. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. In Sports Dateline, Kansas City, Missouri. So one Taylor Swift conspiracy theory was confirmed by developments that disproved the other Taylor Swift conspiracy theory. Now, I, I realize we are entering the world of the big league nut jobs. Elon Musk, Vivek Ramaswamy, Clay Travis, Aaron Rodgers. Travis, who is the mastermind of the website, outkicked the uh, cabbage. Outkicked the cabbage. Is that what it is? 
whatever it's called. He wrote that the Kansas City Chiefs were, quote, not a good football team and that Travis Kelsey should retire. He's been worthless the last seven or eight weeks. The double worthless Pfizer shots may have caught up with him. Either that or Taylor Swift is the Chiefs' Yoko Ono. Maybe both. Sunday, Kelsey caught all 11 passes thrown to him as the Chiefs reached the Super Bowl again. So the vaccinated guy is at the Super Bowl again. And Aaron Rodgers, the the unvaccinated guy, he got hurt 10 seconds into the season and he may never play in the NFL again. But you do you. Of course, that does mean that the other Travis Kelsey Taylor Swift conspiracy theory favored by those too stupid, too stoned or too arrogant to think anything through is alive and well. Yesterday, Vivek Ramaswamy, another guy who has mistaken money for a triple digit IQ he does not have, writes, quote, I wonder who's going to win the Super Bowl next month. I wonder if there's a major presidential endorsement coming from an artificially culturally propped up couple this fall. Just some wild speculation over here. Let's see how it ages over the next eight months. We didn't have to wait that long. After the New York Post slammed little Viv for his Super Bowl conspiracy theory, Ramaswamy then said he never voiced any conspiracy theory. Then, just in case there were any remaining sides for him to take, he tweeted, quote, What the MSM calls a conspiracy theory is often nothing more than an amalgam of incentives hiding in plain sight. Once you see that, the rest becomes pretty obvious. Ooh, Vivek learned a new word, amalgam. Of course, Musk retweeted that writing with deep insight, quote, exactly, unquote. The conspiracy theories get dumber. A jamoke from New Jersey named Mike Crispy, he's had a tough life, writes, the NFL is totally rigged for the Kansas City Chiefs, Taylor Swift, Mr. Pfizer, parentheses, Travis Kelsey, all to spread Democrat talking points. Calling it now. KC wins, goes to Super Bowl. Swift comes out at the halftime show and endorses Joe Biden with Kelsey at midfield. It's all been an op since day one. Dude, I think you've been an op since day one. Or more likely an oops. But seriously, Crispy Mike, if you're somehow right and Biden can fix every NFL game and he can make Taylor Swift start dating Travis Kelsey... You better start worshiping Joe Biden, because if he don't like you, you won't last until next week, will you? Like, what else does Joe Biden control? How much oxygen you get? Thank you, Nancy Faust. Dateline, Atlanta, Georgia. Hello. The Atlanta Falcons did not hire ousted New England Patriots legend Bill Belichick as their new head coach, and it does not look like either the Seattle Seahawks or the Washington Commanders, who have the last two open coaching jobs in the NFL, will. And so the speculation in football land is that Bill Belichick may wind up taking a job in TV. If you know him only as the grunting, monosyllabic star of pre- and post-game news conferences in New England that he would seemingly have gladly swapped for being waterboarded, this may seem implausible to you. In fact, there is every chance Bill Belichick might become the closest thing we have seen since John Madden to John Madden. I'm pretty sure it was in 1995 that I happened to be seated at a sports award banquet in Washington, Bill Belichick was still the young and relatively unknown coach of the original Cleveland Browns. He and I sat next to each other on the dais for three hours for every award imaginable. By award number 270 and hour number two, he and I could no longer look at each other because we were cracking each other up just by gestures and eye rolls. Bill Belichick was one of the funniest people I had ever met, not just in sports, Ever. And charming. And precise. And economical with words. I mean, the mo juste instead of the bon mo. And half of it was self-deprecating. I watch you and Dan four times every Monday morning, he deadpanned. That was how he introduced himself. I watch at home as soon as I get up. Five. Then, then I go into the office and I watch the rerun at seven. 
Then I watch you during the meeting with my coordinators at 8 when we have breakfast. Then by the time I watch you during the whole staff meeting at lunch at noon, I've memorized all the punchlines to your jokes. I shout them out and then I hit the mute button. If somebody hires Bill Belichick and puts him not in a studio panel where he would have to fight to get in a thought, but in a booth with a play-by-play announcer willing to defer to him, we might hear the most honest and the most interesting football commentary since my last Super Bowl broadcast. And no, 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 no. My last Super Bowl broadcast did not contain interesting or honest football commentary. I don't mean my football commentary was ever either interesting or or honest. My last Super Bowl broadcast just happened to be the game after which John Madden retired. Still ahead on Countdown, a former Major League Baseball manager has died and he had many accomplishments, but surely the most distinctive of them was when he was accused by the owner of the other team of trying to start a riot during the middle of their playoff game. He was innocent, of course, but it's still a hell of a story and I will recount it in things I promise not to tell next. First time for the daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. The bronze, worse, sentient right-wing pimple Charlie Kirk, who appears to have gotten the legal scare of a lifetime. Kirk posted on Twitter X, quote, New York City Councilman Yusef Salam, who once took part in the gruesome gang rape of a jogger in Central Park, is now furious that an NYPD officer dared to pull him over for having illegally tinted windows. After getting away with gang rape, Kirk continues... He apparently thinks he deserves to be completely above the law, unquote. That, no, no, Charlie, you're confused. Getting away with rape? Thinks he's above the law? That, that's your boy Trump. Yusef Salam and the others wrongfully accused and wrongfully convicted were cleared even after that idiot Trump called for their execution. Anywho, yesterday morning, somebody apparently told Kirk how much effing trouble he was in because he wrote a one- thousand word long tweet thousand word tweets did we lose a war or something anyway he said he had deleted the original tweet quote because i think additional details or context are warranted (laughs) many people even on the right think the central park five case is a story of five completely innocent men railroaded by a racist justice system who have now been fully and totally exonerated beyond doubt this is not true and i'll explain why 1,000 words of this. So Kirk thought he was covering himself from a lawsuit by Councilman Salam, but over those 1,000 words, he quickly backed away from his seeming legal ass covering and simply quoted the false confession that the cops had beaten out of Salam. And now Salam can sue Kirk over pretending that that was actual truth. Kirk is an arrogant, virulent, stupid, and ever increasingly dangerous racist, and if Councilman Salam needs any help suing him, we should all give it to him. Your runner-up, Elise Stefanik, New York Congresswoman, also stupid, who also used the rise of Trump as an excuse to reveal her inner fascism and sadism. Online, she was eradicated over the weekend by former Congresswoman Liz Cheney over her toadying to Trump. Cheney pointed out the press release Stefanik had issued on January 6, 2021, the day she was photographed in a prone position between benches on the floor of the house with her uh, back facing the camera as the people she now calls hostages broke into the chamber trying to, you know, uh, kill her and or other people like her. That day, the lookalike for one of the characters in the Dr. Rick commercials wrote that those who stormed the Capitol, quote, must be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. After Cheney pointed that out, Stefanik wiped nearly everything off her official website, including that press release. It's a cheesy and tawdry and cowardly thing to do, but there is a silver lining because now if you hit any of those links on Stefanik's site, you are directed to a full screen that shows one word that could easily be her campaign slogan going forward. Quote, error, 
unquote. But our winner, former South Dakota Snow Queen and now South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem. Yes, yeah, she was once voted Snow Queen, then they made her governor. It has been alleged that Noem is a dope who might be the person who actually made the apocryphal statement of alarm. Wait, there's a North Dakota? Noem has now lent credence to this theory, defending the attempt by Republican governors led by Greg Abbott of Texas to overrule the Supreme Court and begin an insurrection. Yeah, another one, that's what they do. Noam goes on Fox and says, quote, Texas and the 13 original colonies would have never signed the treaty that formed the first constitution of the United States if they didn't think their right to protect themselves was protected. It's hard to tell if Noam is that stupid or she thinks her constituents are that stupid, or she thinks that Fox hosts are that stupid, or all of the above, but somebody is that stupid. I mean, she is moving into the Sarah Palin, Michelle Bachman, Bluto, Blutarski Hall of Fame level of historical idiocy. The, on his way to his first inauguration, George Washington told his limo driver that Abraham Lincoln had a lovely singing voice. That level of historical idiocy. The Constitution was not the result of some treaty. When it went into effect in 1789, Texas was still part of Mexico. Thirteen colonies had nothing to do with Mexican Texas in 1789, and Mexico didn't let Texas go until 1836, and Texas wasn't even admitted to our country until 1845 as the 28th state. I mean, this was nearly a decade after we let in Arkansas, for God's sakes. Texas, the new experimental state. Christy, did we give up when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? Gnome, nitwit, two days, worst person in the world, and worst thing. Finally, we merge part of the sports segment with things I promised not to tell and the sad news that the former manager of the Boston Red Sox, the Houston Astros, and the Toronto Blue Jays, Jimmy Williams, has died at the age of 80. Jimmy, that's Jimmy with one M, managed for 10 full seasons and finished second six times, including three straight years to the last dynasty in baseball, the Yankees of the turn of the century. He was many things, and uniquely, he was probably the only manager ever accused by the owner of the other team of trying to incite a riot by the fans during a playoff game. And the owner made that accusation about Jimmy Williams live on national television during the game, and of course, the person he made the accusation to was me. And that was only because I was the reporter in the Yankees' dugout for the series in question, the 1999 American League Championship Series, and there actually was a riot, or at least the beginning of one, and I managed during it to get myself kicked off the field and ordered to sit next to... uh, But I'm getting ahead of myself. The good stuff started in Game 3 on Saturday, October 16th, 1999, and it featured the return of the former Red Sox hero Roger Clemens in the uniform of the hated Yanks to Fenway Park, Boston. I don't have much time for Roger Clemens, but I was a witness to two occasions, possibly the only two occasions of his life, when he received the raw deal rather than dishing it out. The fans at Boston's Fenway Park blamed Clemens for leaving the Old Town team two years previously when it was a decision actually made by Red Sox management. So they serenaded and booed him out of that game after just 15 batters and just over two innings, and our Fox TV cameras caught them tearing down Roger Clemens' banners, which hung outside the park. Poor Roger, completely rattled, fell apart like a $12 fake Rolex, and from where I sat between the third base camera and the Yankee dugout, you could see he was ashen. The game got out of hand quickly, a theme for the series. Boston led 13-0 in the seventh inning. One of the oddities of my seat was that between me and the Yankee bench was a low railing and very ancient chicken wire fence that had been painted over annually for something like since the First World War. But next to the fence on the player's side was the dugout bathroom. It was really just a door and a urinal. 
So at some point, every Yankee player came down to that end of the dugout, and almost always they said, hi, and then, excuse me a minute. Late in the game, as it got dark, the Yankees' superb Cuban emigre pitcher Orlando El Duque Hernandez made that trek and said, hi, but did not go into the tiny bathroom in the dugout at Fenway Park. Instead, he sat down on the steps right next to the little chicken wire fence, and he said, Keith, can I ask you a question? I was startled. The official line was, El Duque Hernandez did not speak any English. I pointed this out to him. He laughed. You'll keep my secret? You know how much time I save not doing interviews in English? He got an occasional conjugation wrong. Otherwise, his English was perfect. He got to his question. Keith, why'd you leave Sports Center? You and Dan were so good. Way downtown, bang. They're not going to get them. I suspect anybody sitting in the stands in the 10 rows nearest me could hear my laughter. Orlando, I left Sports Center before you left Cuba. How did you see us? He said, we have nothing in Cuba, but we have baseball fields and we have satellites. It's deep and I don't think it's playable. I was stunned. I had already discovered that nearly every American-born Major League player of 1999 knew me by voice, let alone by sight. But this Cuba thing and El Duque reciting my old Sports Center catchphrases was a genuine surprise. Oh, yes, you and Dan, you teach me a lot of my English. What's the one for the hockey? Can't believe I shook that guy's freaking hand. I love that. Why'd you leave? I tried to explain. It was mostly geography that if when he had pitched briefly in the International League, he ever faced the team in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, that that was kind of where ESPN was, only it was more remote, much smaller town. Oh, El Duque said, like Cuba, but with snow. And I said, yeah, that was it. Exactly. And now I was living in Los Angeles and I owned a big house on the beach. Okay, I get it. Listen, you see me in the park, you say hi. There's nobody around, we talk, Okay. If I say nothing, don't be offended. I'm just making sure everybody still knows I don't speak English. <laughs> Orlando Hernandez did not get here until he was 32 years old. He pitched until he was 41. If he'd gotten here when he was 22, he'd be in the Hall of Fame, and then he would have been the color man on the game of the week. He pitched three years for the Yankees and two for the Mets while I lived in New York, and it was always a pleasure to see him. Keith, you still collecting baseballs? You want this one? I walked Barry Bonds with this one. So that was game three on the Saturday. On the Sunday, I awoke to see my picture in the Boston Globe. In those days, the newspapers all used to have columnists who wrote about nothing but TV and radio sportscasts. No, seriously. I had been a sportscaster on local TV in Boston 15 years earlier in 1984, and I'd been to Fenway Park as long before as 1966, and yet I had grown up a Yankee fan in New York. I explained that even then, I was also a fan of the long-suffering Red Sox fans. Now, this was too complicated for some people at the Boston Globe, which quoted me correctly as saying, I always felt an affinity with the fans, but then under my picture in the article, used the caption, Olbermann, Red Sox fan. Still wondering how they got that wrong, I did my pregame TV stuff for Fox, then climbed over the little chicken wire fence back into my spot for in-game dugout reporting. And as the top of the first inning began of the fourth game, the Yankees' leadoff man Chuck Knobloch moved towards the plate, and as he did, it was the cleanup hitter Bernie Williams walking towards me, presumably to use that little urinal in a closet. Wrong again. It's Meet Keith Weekend. Hey, Keith, he said in his lyrical voice, extending a hand to shake. Bernie Williams, like I didn't know who it was. Say, listen, I was reading the paper. Are you a Red Sox fan? For a moment, I put aside the fact that the game, the playoff game, had now started, and the guy up three batters from now was asking me about a typo in the Boston Globe. Bernie Williams was never accused of burning himself out with too much competitive focus. That's just who he was. I explained the mistake as quickly as I could. Oh, I thought so. Okay, good. Uh, I'm glad because you can be a fan of anybody you want, but I don't think it would be right to have a Red Sox fan in our dugout. I agreed with him. Just as Chuck Knobloch singled and the number two hitter, Derek Jeter, advanced to the plate, and the third hitter, Paul O'Neill, went out to the on-deck circle. And that's when Bernie Williams surprised me more than Orlando Hernandez had. Plus, Bernie went on, doesn't your mom still have those seats like 10 rows back of our dugout at Yankee Stadium? This was before my mother became famous for getting hit by a very badly thrown ball the next year. 
I asked Bernie Williams how the hell he knew where my mother sat. Well, you, you've had seats there since the 70s, haven't you? I just stared at him. Oh, uh, Keith, it's my job to know that. I said, no, it isn't. It's your job to play center field for the Yankees. This was just about the time Derek Jeter grounded out and Paul O'Neill left the on-deck circle and Bernie Williams was supposed to be in the on-deck circle. I know your mom. I see her. Nice lady. So anyway, I interrupted him. Uh, Bernie, Jeter just grounded out and Knobloch went to second and, and O'Neill is up with one out. Shouldn't you get out there? He looked back at the field of play. Oh, yeah, you're right. He stuck out his hand again. Nice visiting with you. Let's talk more later. And just just double checking. You're, you're not a Red Sox fan, right? Bernie Williams got three hits in that game. Another New York sports reporter once said that if he concentrated on baseball, really concentrated, Bernie Williams would either be so good that he would hit 400 or he would be so stressed out that he would become a serial killer. In this game, the Yankees scored six runs in the ninth, and there was a play so controversial that when the Red Sox manager got himself ejected over it, the home fans littered the field with debris. Almost all of it was just plastic soda bottles, but still, there was a couple of flasks thrown, too. Yankees manager Joe Torre ordered his team off the field, and play was suspended as the plastic bottles continued to fly, and via my earpiece which I listened to even if Chris Matthews never listened to his, my producer ordered me onto the field, and I did as I was told, and I sat up in front of the camera right in front of the dugout full of Yankee players. A plastic bottle whizzed past my head, and I half wondered if Bernie Williams had thrown it just in case I was a Red Sox fan. Almost immediately, a Fenway Park security guy started swearing at me in Boston and told me if I didn't get off the field and into the seats immediately, he'd have me arrested. This time I could actually hear some of the Yankees laughing. Get over that fence right now. Sit your backside down in that seat and do not move. My producer heard all this through my microphone and told me to comply. I didn't even look around. I just went over the fence. I sat down in the front row where I'd been ordered to. And that's when the guy sitting next to me said, hi. And I realized the guy sitting next to me was George Steinbrenner, the owner of the Yankees. I said, hi, you want to say something about this on TV? And George, who loved me as I loved him, said, sure. And my producer heard all this through to the microphone as well. The announcers immediately threw it to me, and I said seven words. George Steinbrenner, your thoughts on all this? He proceeded to very pleasantly blame the Red Sox fans for being drunk, blame Fenway security for letting a riot start, blame baseball officials for not immediately forfeiting the game to his club, and blame the Boston manager for inciting the crowd. I had said to George, I would ask a follow-up, but you seem to have covered everything, and so I threw it back to the play-by-play booth. Steinbrenner's remarks made every newspaper in the country, and in many accounts, I was noted as the interview, and frankly, I didn't really do anything. The next night, the Yankees won the series in five games, and the fifth game was devoid of Cuban pitchers confiding they were fans, or Bernie Williams quizzing me about my fandom, or me being ordered onto the field during a riot only to be thrown off of it and directly into the seat next to the owner of the Yankees. All I had to do on this night was get into the Yankee clubhouse two innings before the game ended so I could cover the celebrating players and the award presentation. The excitement of the weekend clearly was over. I would just say hi to these guys. They'd throw champagne in my direction, and then I'd throw it back to Joe Buck. I was on a platform, bleached in a camera light as the technicians checked their stuff. The game was still going on when the clubhouse door slammed open and in strutted the Yankee second baseman Chuck Knobloch. He was swearing profusely, profoundly, and proficiently. He had been having trouble throwing ground balls away, and as the eighth inning started, Yankee manager Torrey had removed him, denying him a chance to be in the on-field celebration of the pennant. Knobloch was enraged, so enraged that he never saw me or the platform or the camera lights. He used all the known expletives and directed all of them all at his own manager. The Yankees PR guy, a childhood friend of mine, rushed over to insist that I could not report what I had just heard. He was a little shocked when I agreed with him. I'm here as a lighting prop, I told him. Knobloch has a perfect right to expect there be no reporters in the clubhouse during the game. If he says it again afterwards, I'll say I heard it just now. Otherwise, I'm not saying anything.
There is, of course, a punchline even to this and this extraordinary weekend. The next summer, Chuck Knobloch's career as a second baseman ended because he completely lost the ability to throw an ordinary, uncomplicated baseball to first base. Since similar cases of the yips seemed to afflict players whose baseball-centric fathers had gotten sick or jailed or something, and Knobloch's dad had just entered the final stages of Alzheimer's, it was probably that. The last disastrous throw he made the next year on June 17, 2000, bounced off the Yankee dugout and spun weirdly and hit a woman in the box seats. The woman was my mother. The one where Bernie Williams knew where she sat. All the things that followed since I was in the studio that day doing the highlights for the Fox Game of the Week, they require their own segment of this. But the one thing that has always mystified me was how Chuck Knobloch did not know not to throw the ball where he did, because at some point, Bernie Williams must have warned him, hey, hey, Chuck, don't do it there. That's where Keith Olbermann's mother sits. done all the damage i can do here thank you for listening countdown has come to you from the world headquarters of the olderman broadcasting empire in new york countdown musical directors brian ray and john philip chanel arranged produced and performed most of our music mr ray was on guitars bass and drums and mr chanel handled orchestration and keyboards produced by tko brothers other music including some of the beethoven compositions arranged and performed by no horns allowed Sports music is the Olbermann theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc. Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by Nancy Faust, best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was my friend Jonathan Banks. Everything else was pretty much my fault. That's countdown for this, the 281st day until the 2024 U.S. presidential election and the 1,120th day since Dementia J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Use the 14th Amendment, Justice Scalia. Use the Insurrection Act. Use the justice system and the mental health system to stop him from doing it again while we still can. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Bulletins as the news warrants. And if my throat holds out, till then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck. <laughs>